All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I do want to let you know that this session is going to be recorded. And uh, if you don't want your image um, on camera, just make sure you turn off your um, on the video, just make sure you turn off your camera or cover your camera. <clears throat> All right. So let's just start right off the bat with just a breathe, breathe in, breathe out. Uh, it's already been a fast and furious afternoon. Um, so let's just take a minute to just uh, follow uh, the bubble on your screen of breathing in, holding it, and breathing out. Breathing in, holding it, and breathing out. All right, so those of you that are educators, this is a really cool tool to, uh, to use in, um, uh, in Zoom meetings and different things that you're doing with your students. Um, and we will send you uh, the presentation so you have access to the link of where we, where we got these. Um, so we want to know, we're just gonna dive right in, friends, because we do not have that much time and I wanna be able to cover as much as I can with you today. Um, so we know that co-regulation builds self-regulation. And one of the core tenets of trauma-informed practices is that we don't do two, we don't do four, we do with. And we know that it is very important to understand that, um, that we have to help students, our children, young adults, we have to help them build those regulation strategies. Uh, and the way we do that is definitely through being with them. Uh, co-regulating with them. Um, all, everybody needs support at varying levels as they grow in order to develop those regulations, to develop that self-regulation strategies. It's not just something that you just know how to do. Uh, it is definitely something that takes uh, time and it takes being with, with someone to do it. So when we are in our fight, flight or freeze, when we're in that response system, we know that fight might look like verbal escalation or physical agitation. Uh, it might just be like, you know, uh, just tense. We know that when we're in the flight, that it might look like scared or panicky. Maybe they're having difficulty catching their breath, might want to leave or maybe even avoid the situation. And in the freeze, that might look, might look watchful and quiet, spacey or dazed, um, and possibly emotionally shut down. So when I am dysregulated, my tendency is definitely to go into the freeze, um, where I just kind of just, whew, just shut down. So some physical signs of dysregulation, um, I mean, these are just some. But these are definitely ones that we see a lot. You know, I remember being it when I was in the classroom, you know, when I would have a student that would have a stomach ache, it seemed every time it was math class, you know, and we know that, um, we know that uh, behavior is really just uh, showing us, uh, showing us like we need to dig in deeper and find out what's really going on. And so with that particular student, uh, the kiddo was just so stressed out every time because he was just afraid he was going to, he didn't know what to do, didn't know how to do it, was afraid to ask questions. So we had to develop some different uh, strategies and stuff to help him so that the stomach ache didn't always come right at math class time. So when you are dysregulated, what are your physical signs? For me, I tend to shut down. Um, I also, my ears get a little red sometimes. Um, when I'm dysregulated and I feel a little hot. Um, but if you just flood that chat box right now with what, when you're dysregulated, what are your physical signs? Because everybody's a little different and it's good to know different signs um, so that we can recognize those with our students um, and with patients and with our own children. So when we're dis so while we're dysregulated, we know 
that we cannot think logically, rationally, or even accept any responsibility for what's going on. We have to be able to work ourselves into that relationship brain in order to really begin conversation about what's happening. But when we're in that survival brain, it's not the time for us to have a rational conversation. We physically cannot have a rational conversation. Um, the, the other issue with, with survival brain to the relationship brain is that it takes time. It's not just quickly, can I just switch and go into the relationship brain? Um, some, uh, you know, some uh, scientists have even done some studies on this and there's lots of different varied research, but sometimes when a student is dysregulated, it could take up seven, seven and a half minutes for them to, oh, to be maybe ready to start. Uh, being in that relationship brain to have some conversations. But you know what? Everybody is different. I had a student, it was 17 and a half minutes for his, for his body, for his brain, for him to just be able to calm down, to be ready to, to start having a conversation. It took me all year to figure that out. Um, I so wish I would have known that uh, earlier. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that we want to know is that when we're in regulation, the suggested response is definitely that we want to, when we're dysregulated, the suggested response for co-regulation is, first of all, flush the body of cortisol. So one easy way to do that is just by giving somebody some water. Drink this water. No conversation. Drink this water. We also want to increase the oxytocin. Okay, that's the connection. And we know that right now, like, students in a classroom or um, that's hard for us to do because we're over the internet um, but we can still create connection over the internet it just looks different it looks different uh, in our own homes a way to create create oxytocin is 20 second hugs um, there's so much science that um, that talks about that how 20 second hugs really can help change things um, and the other thing um, that we know is that when we're trying to shift from the survival brain into the relationship brain, we can, it can be supported through grounding, breathing, and reflection strategies. And so that's what we want to dig into right now. And friends, I just want to tell you, we're going to go fast and furious here. But I do want you to know that you're going to have access to all of this information, this presentation. Uh, early next week, we'll be sending that out to everybody. All right, so let's talk for just a moment about grounding strategies. So when we are thinking about grounding strategies, those are strategies that we need. Um, really, Grounding strategies is, is really just a set of simple strategies that can help a person detach from emotional pain. And it's basically a way to distract yourself by focusing on something other than the difficult emotion that emotions that you're experiencing. So some things you might notice is that rapid speech, that sensitivity to sound, that those delayed responses. So if we think about this, Here's an example of a grounding strategy. Senses, five, four, three, two, one. You know, you have uh, your own kiddo, <laughs> yourself maybe, um, that is dysregulated. Look around the room. Name five things you can see. Four you can hear. Three you can touch. Two you can smell. And one that you can taste. And I, I'd love for you to flood the chat box to think, why? Why would these grounding strategies help? Um, why this idea of detaching for a moment to focus in on something else? Why is that, why is that pro proactive and why is that practical? So another grounding strategy is tactile textures. Um, and this is a really easy one to do, um, is just having a variety of different objects with various textures, denim, plastic, uh, sandpaper, corduroy, foam. And really all people are doing is just filling their way through the basket, noticing the textures, the weight, the temperature, the touch. Um, another strategy is tension release, all right? And so within the tension release, it's just really that time if we think about, um, you know, just oh, putting, putting our shoulders down, um, you know, or moving our shoulders, 
rolling our shoulders. Um, there's some wonderful resources out there um, out of um, Anxiety Canada that have some really great like muscle relaxation um, strategies, tension release strategies uh, that you can use. Uh, one of my favorites is guided meditation. Um, and we are not going to have time to try it out, but again, uh, the script that I was going to use will be in the presentation. Uh, there's a lot of different things out there, especially right now. Um, uh, the Calm app, Headspace, uh, there's, uh, there's so many different apps out there right now that are just providing some really great uh, meditation type activities. Um, I use the Calm app just about almost every evening. Um, I play one, it's usually about an eight minute one that we use uh, uh, when it's time to go to sleep and it's a deep sleep rest one. Um, the other thing about the Calm app that I love is that they do have what they call sleep stories. It's kind of like a bedtime story uh, and so it's wonderful for children um, as well. So another uh, so another regulation strategy within the grounding is water and food. We already talked about how water is really a great grounding strategy, but also things like peppermints, beef jerky, uh, applesauce, sour candy, things that have a strong taste or a chewy texture. And, the, and we know that this is a great thing to do. First of all, if you give a kid beef jerky, um, or if you give me some beef jerky, I'm, I'm going to be chewing on it. I'm not going to be able to talk. And so it's a really great thing to just focusing in on the chomping or the chewing or the drinking of the water. So some different types of breathing strategies. So we know we, we need a breathing strategy when um, things to notice is that rate of breath, our posture maybe is either slouched over um, there's a lot of body tension, and also one that is fascinating to me is frequent yawning. If you see that, then a breathing strategy would be a great option. Um, so one simple one is a four, seven, eight breathing strategy, um, and you're uh, you're placing your tongue at the ridge of the tissues behind your upper front teeth. Um, there's some really specific steps with this one, and so. Um, this, this is a really good one to teach um, to your family, to patients, to your students. Now we're going to try one out right now. Um, this one's called a finger calm, okay? And so what I want you to do is you're going to um, put your fingers like this. So you have your thumbs and then um, you have a finger there. And so when the body is feeling extra stress, it's a really good idea to pair something physical, breathy, and cognitive together. So we're going to try that right now. So the first stage is we're going to practice the sensation movements. And what we're going to do is all we're going to do is we're going to press. So I'm, I have my, my finger there, and then I'm going to move to the next one. And then I can go back. Okay, so once we have that down, then we're going to add a sentence, okay? And it's, it's a four, um, a four-part sentence, okay? So, I am okay. Now, you can either just repeat, you can say that quietly to yourself, you can say that in your head, or you can say it aloud. I am okay. So the third part is a breath in, breath out, okay? So breathing in, so I'm thinking in my head, I, breath out, breath in, breath out. So, and then you repeat, you can repeat that. You can do it on one hand or two, uh, it really just depends. But this is a really simple, um, and quick finger regulation breathing strategy to do. And I love the idea of pairing the physical, the breathy, and the cognitive together. Belly breathing is always a great one. Um, I'm sure many of you have used that before. And then uh, breath walks, where we're just thinking about breathing ratios, uh, intervals, and breath types um, as, we are, um, as we are walking. 
Um, all right, so the, uh, the last set of regulation strategies is the reflection, okay? And we know that we're ready for a regulation strategy in terms of reflection when our breath is controlled, when our eyes are focused, normal speech and calm hands. Um, so some different kinds of reflection strategies is affirmations. Scientists can confirm that speaking positively about ourselves to ourselves out loud actually changes our brain. So we want to be able to help people develop and repeat I am type statements. So affirmations that I, you know, I am loved, I am safe, I am good, I am enough. So tell us in the, uh, the chat box, what are affirmations that you use? Um, and I will link in the presentation um, one of my favorite Instagram accounts. It's Danica Bershant, and um, she posts affirmations every day. Um, and I always love, it's probably one of, it's probably the second thing I do in the morning after I put on the coffee is go and look at the affirmation that she's posted for the day. Um, another idea is just creating a mini timeline, you know, um, ask the person to create a timeline of their day, ask them to name in order five things they've accomplished today. And one of the reasons why we know that this is a good idea is that if we have, if we have been dysregulated, if we are struggling, um, it's always good to be able to say, oh gosh, but I did this, but I did that, but I did this. And so it's another way to help our brain and to help us to feel, okay, I, I'm, I, you know, I can, I can start moving into that relationship and, and into that thriving brain. Journaling is one of my first loves. And so journaling has had a huge impact on my life personally. And so journaling as a reflection strategy is just kind of common, common nature to me at this point but it's something that I learned and I developed over um, a long time period. Um, some really simple things, uh, when we know somebody is ready for this type of reflection strategy, um, honestly, some of these prompts are just beautiful to use. If this feeling was a color, it would be. If the feeling was weather, it would be. You know, one time I had a student say, if this feeling was weather, it would be a, torn, uh, a tornado and a hurricane at the same time. So that tells me, as his teacher, like, okay, we, we, we're, we're, we're just about ready to have some good conversation here about this. And maybe we're, we're not going to figure it all out, but we're going to start. Um, if this feeling was music, it would sound like, um, and you think like, uh, it's, it could sound really loud. It could be very quiet. Um, uh, so depending on um, where the student or the patient or your family member is at, um, there's so many different ways that journaling can be used. Um, I am a huge, huge believer in using journaling um, for gratitude reasons as well. Um, I think that any time that we can reflect on um, gratitude that that is something that is going to help us and um, support us. So I just want to remind you that when we're talking about strategies, we're talking, uh, when we're talking about self-regulation strategies, any of these strategies, when we're first learning them, we're doing them with, especially with, with students, with our, with our own kiddos, um, with students and our own family members. Um, we don't ever want to just say, go to the calm corner. You know, at, if we're just sending a student uh, to a calm corner, they don't necessarily know what to do there. And it's not going to promote any type of regulation. And so that co-regulation piece is so, so critical. And so just again, reminding you that we don't do two, we don't do four, that we're doing with. Um, so let's open up. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, let's just uh, let's just talk. Let's put some things in the chat. And um, what are some of those regulation strategies that stood out to you or does uh, or questions that you might have? Oh, thank you, Tammy, for putting that in there. Oh, and I love seeing all these affirmations when I do the screen share. It's hard to see everything. 
Um, but uh, I'm strong, I can handle this, I'm safe, I'm brave. What are some other things? Um, so we have, uh, we have a question, I think, uh, are these choices? Do one or do all in a row? Yeah, I think um, as students uh, and as family members and as yourself learn different strategies, you learn what works best for you. Um, and you kind of end up going to those specific ones. Um, I think though, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing to have the opportunity to be able to introduce lots of different strategies to find out what truly works. Hey, Carmen, I'm not sure if you saw the question. Yeah. Um, as a teacher, if I need to do something with a student, yeah. what do I do with my other students? Yeah, so uh, a couple of different things. One of the things is that we do want to try to be proactive in teaching different types of regulation strategies. And so things like Go Noodle, um, uh, you know, Go Noodle has some amazing regulation type uh, flows and different things that we can learn how to do those things together. Um, and so that students do have some back pocket strategies that they might be able to use when it comes to that time. Sometimes as a teacher, um, you know, we were, worked real closely with paras um, to be able to help um, and um, and uh, to be able to maybe take the group that I was with or to take this uh, to be able either to be able to help that student specifically or um, to be in the front of the classroom. Um, and sometimes we would we would just breathe together <laughs> as a whole class and it's okay to do that and it's important to model that as well. Um, so another question that I see is um, what would you do if you have a student who refuses? They're not ready. They're not ready. Um, and so I think the best thing is, is to hand them some more water or to uh, take them down to get a drink of water. Um, if they're not ready for the regulation strategies yet, it's okay. They're still deep in that survival brain and we need to give them time. Um, I think as teachers, we tend to want things to move at a really fast pace, partly because we do have 25 other students that we need to attend to. And um, so just know it's okay. Um, but it's, it's also sometimes we just have to let them um, sit for a minute um, or two or three. You know, I think of my student um, that I shared 17 minutes that he needed to be before it was ready for us to do some co-regulation. Um, I always tried to intervene quicker and that always backfired, always backfired. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How, okay, there's another question. I'm sorry, Karen, I see. Um, how do we use these strategies with children who are calm one second and the next they are destroying the classroom? How do we catch them before a meltdown? Yeah, oh, I, it's so hard. And I think it's, it's a lot of it is just part of the proactiveness of things, which I'm sure that you do that all the time, Karen. Um, and uh, helping with uh, the idea of lots of breaks as well for students that are constantly going between, uh, they're probably living in, the in their survival brain most of the time if they're going from zero to 60 all the time. And so things that we need to provide for them really is that I'm, I'm with you. It's that resilience. We wanna be, we want to be that safe buffering caring adult around them. Um, and we have to know that um, we're, we're not here to fix everything, we're here to support um, and try to figure out things. Um, we just did a really great interview with Dr. Ross Green, um, and it's on our ESDAC page. Um, and Ross Green is a, a, a psychologist, a, a clinical psychologist who has done a tremendous amount of work with kiddos just like that. And um, he, um, he talks a lot about lagging skills and about um, coming together with family um, to create those proactive solutions. And so I would highly recommend that you spend some time. Uh, I think it's about a 40, 40 minute interview that we just did with him just this last week. Um, I think that will be really helpful for you. Um, and his book, The Explosive Child, um, and also uh, Lost at School, Lost at School for me is probably one of the 
uh, seminal text, <laughs> um, uh, but just wise, wise words he has um, uh, specifically about what you're asking about. Um, Carmen, are you talking about ESDAC's Facebook page or ESDAC's website? ESDAC's Facebook page. Perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, I know. I know everything is going very fast today. Um, we have learned very quickly that we need longer sessions. <laughs> um, so we just know that we will, um, you will get a copy. Um, you will get a copy of the presentation. You'll also get a video of the presentation. Early next week, we'll be sending all of that out. So um, I am so sorry to tell you, but it is time for us to head back to the next, uh, to the main room. Chris is going to drop that link um, and just know that we are, um, we're here and you can find me on Twitter at Ms. Zeisler. Tammy, could you put that in the, in the chat? Um, and I'm here to help and support you however I can. Carmen, E-I or I-E? E-I, E-I. <laughs> My math brain never gets it right. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. We appreciate you.